the irrational kind, the kind that you use. I mean, Tui is a, a radical of a sort in the book. And so, I, but I wanted to start with the first as context for the second. Um, yeah, it struck me that in the three big ideas that you broached, that the, the idea that a, a work of art, uh, a life, uh, or, or a life need to be fully integrated is at the heart of what makes the ideas behind the fountainhead truly radical. Because the idea there was you say yes to the fully integrated whole and you say no to anything that is an exception to it, to anything that is at odds with it, to anything that negates it. And that's an attitude he has not just about his buildings when he's rejecting compromises uh, to the design, um, but to his life. I came here to say I don't recognize anyone's right to even one minute of my life. That's a radical approach. And so, I mean, I, I guess the question to start things off, Greg, is uh, if we should be radical in that way about our lives, why? Seems like so much. Well, what's the alternative? It's the alternative is living someone else's life. I mean, that is, if it so happened that what everybody wanted to do and wanted you to do and the way they wanted to live was how it made sense for you to live and how it made sense to you for you to live, doing your own thinking and so forth, then um, so be it. But that's, insofar as that's not the case, the alternative is to coast and not spend your time doing something you love doing and to waste your life or to try to be happy. I mean, this is just work and the dean. But part of what I think is... is the radicalism here, though, is uh, what makes me think of it as radical where it might not be in some other context. You can imagine a world where, you know, workish art was um, very much loved and appreciated. Um, is there's so much about the culture that Rourke's way of life means rejecting. It's not like there's a, a, a side or a, 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 you know, sizable group that's you know there at the ready to receive this. That's exciting about this. Excited about this. Um, I think the kind of presentation in the thousand that suggests that there's never likely to be. It's always going to be, um, you know, uh, small pockets of people. But Rourke's ideas are really radical, and that he's rejecting. Let me put it another way. I mean, Tui is the conventional. I don't mean that Tui's a conventional type of person. He's not. But he's a priest for the conventional morality, the conventional ideals of what's good. Everybody's heard since their mother's milk, with their mother's milk, you know, and, and imbibed as part of, of the Tui kind of ideas, the Tui kind of philosophy. He's maybe a particularly virulent form of it, but the, I think it's a premise of the novel, and I think it's true that Tui's a kind of writ large version of um, the what we're brought up to think is right. And Rourke is an opposite of that, a kind of rebuke to that, um, an alternative to it. And that, and to me, seems like this novel is really, really radical. It's telling us, you know, what you think is good, what you're taught is good is not. And it's not just one corner, like the liberals or the conservatives are, you know, the bad ones, or the church or the socialists or whatever. It's it's everywhere, right? The, the, two, the, the, the two-ism, the altruism, is presented as the conventional, the bromide, the stale, the assumed. And this novel, like, pulls the mask off it and presents something really stark as the alternative. Jason, do you want to comment on the idea that two-e is not a radical but conventional? It's a, it's a, surprising, a surprising formulation. Yeah, sure no, people. that's right. Yeah, he's, he's, in a sense, he's entirely um, conventional. Um, by his own admission, he is just saying what people have been saying for over 2,000 years. The only difference, what is radical, but also to some extent not entirely psychologically realistic, is that whereas they thought uh, that if you could get this philosopher's stone, uh, which is how Tui refers to the contract where work completely signs over Cortland to 
Peter, that that would turn uh, lead into gold. And Tui is, says, but I realize it'll just, it turns gold into lead. Right? The only difference is that Tui knows that it's just going to destroy everything, that he's not idealistic. But every, every other way, he's saying what they've always been saying. Um, he, is a, he is a radical um, in the sense that probably politically, he's, it never says it, but he's probably just a Marxist, um, and he keeps it sort of under wraps, or at least he's definitely a socialist, um, and, and he admires um, the collectivist states and the bloodier ones in, in fact, and I think there's some suggestion when it talks about you know people of his sort. Some of it's just spiritually in certain ways, but some of it might just be you know just collectivist. Um, but but com of the time rhetoric, yeah, organized, organized. Yes, but, but, but could I just push back a little bit on the premise of the way you phrased the question to Greg? Because I don't think it's radical or entirely revolutionary the idea that. A single life, a single soul, um, a single work of art should have one unifying idea that should not be betrayed. You no, find no, no, that's not what I was saying. I was saying um, that, that practicing that can, implies being radical about the choices you make, insofar as you make no exceptions. It's not that it's a new idea. I mean, it's that it's it's it it's absolutist. That's. I think in in Nietzsche, um, but it's not. Um, but it what's not in Nietzsche is the way that it's productive, um, and the way that it's non-sacrificial. Um, the the Rourke version of it isn't fully there yet. Um, uh, not, not only in Nietzsche, who's a kind of individualist of a poetic sort, but like in like think of. Um, a man for all seasons, like the kind of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of um, standing up for people who stood on principle and were martyrs to their principle, that's been uh, long valorized, yeah. so long as the people weren't doing it for themselves. Yeah. Uh, la right, so long de, as it was a sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, la Pucelle de Léonion, um, um, Saint, uh, Joan Joan, yeah, Saint Joan, uh, all of these, um, uh, I think, have some, some of that. I, here's one thing that is it's not radical today, but it would have been at least more radical, a little more blow your hair back in the 30s and 40s. And that is the extent to which um, conformity as annihilated as, as any kind of reasonable value. So when you hear about the 1920s, 1930s, and, and I think it's probably true to the, the time, but there's a kind of weird thing that feels a little bit stuffy and antiquated about, you know, oh yeah, like you should want to fit in, and you know, Peter's good, he, a good guy, gets along, and the fact that, um, you know, there's no interest in that from work and, and no acknowledgement of why that would, you know, would be good. That I think is, we're apt today where um, so many, you know, um, why a dystopian novels have like made the theme clear to young Americans that like conformity isn't a good thing, just like and you should say that like everybody else. But um, I, but uh, that I, I think the anti -com that you know the think for yourself thing in some ways probably ran a little bit more against the conservatism at the time. So I still want to go back to understanding the point of those two, the idea that he's conventional. Uh, you, you, you're right. He says I've been saying the same things as everybody all along, but I, just for our sake of our audience, what does that mean? I mean, you said he was a Marxist. People haven't been Maybe. saying Marxist ideas all along. What ideas has he, does he preach that people have been conventionally Give, preaching for hundreds of thousands? But the thousands. essence is renounce. Renounce your values. Mm -hmm. And to seek your own values is immoral. To give up your values and in service of others is moral. And reason is the enemy of this effort to make people give this up and serve others. That, um, and that we should have a world of force to do it. Christianity. It's Christianity, it's, it's Plato. Um, but that is, that is Tui, right? Tui yeah. is the Christian turned Marxist, mm -hmm. not because he's had a change of heart, but because he thinks Marxism is better at what Christianity did than Christianity was, mm -hmm. uh, or better for our time or something like that. It's the, and it's a theme of the novel 
it's a minor, it's not the major thing, but it's, they seem to not all that these things are all the same. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Alvascar, like, well, you, you're something of a radical Ellsworth, uh, meaning a leftist, a red, but here you are working for this arch conservative, you know, Christian newspaper, the banner, or not Christian, but, you know, conservative. Wyden's a conservative, right? So, like, the Wyden papers are Fox News, right? And, uh, and, and Tui is like, you know, whatever, the uh, woke social justice warrior who's working for Fox News. But the point is, these things are the same. The, what they've always been on about is the same. They're just slightly different flavors of the same thing. Um, I, and what is that thing? That thing is renounce. And it doesn't matter if you're renouncing for uh, a god or for the proletariat or for what, what renunciation is about what conventional morality is about, what altruism is about, is um, raising Ike to destroy Ibsen, raising Peter Keating and Gus Webb to destroy Rourke, and what actual idealism is, is what Rourke is. And and, um, Tui, in fact, acknowledges that these are only superficially different in a dinner, in probably like the most insufferable dinner party you could imagine with um, Mitchell Layton, uh, who I think is kind of an early model for, for um, Taggart. Layton is the most Taggart-esque of the characters. Um, and, uh, and other moments too. In fact, in the big kind of uh, the mustache twirling kind of scene with Keating in uh, chapter 13 of part four, he even points out that it's, it's sort of to their favor that they can purportedly have two sides, right? Give sacrifice to the race versus sacrifice to the economic class. Sacrifice to the proletariat versus sacrifice to the leader. But renounce, 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 right? And two, he says, my favorite way is poison as food and poison as antidote. So I also want to ask a little bit about what's rational about this radicalism of the fountainhead. You actually gave a talk at the beginning of last fall on rational radicalism. And so it, it's, it's clear from what you've both established so far that uh, the ideas, the moral ideas and their political consequences of the, of the Fountainhead are, are pretty new compared to all the different intellectual traditions they're challenging. But uh, it's one thing to say something new and op- oppose everything old. It's another thing to have a good reason for it. So what is... What's rational about this radical approach? Jason, do you want to take well, this? Can I, can I first say what's radical about this rational approach and then what's rational about this radical approach? So sure. what's radical about this rational approach um, is, I think, a, a couple of things. Um, in um, Take some concretes. The two trials that Rourke has to defend himself for and that we are to find be on his side, right? He's the protagonist and to be sympathetic, are where, um, uh, are in the case of a uh, temple to the human spirit that was later turned into um, a home for subnormal children and were to see this as a debasement of a holy thing, right? A sacrilege. Um, And then the other is where he, you know, uh, destroys a housing project. now, to say, you know, like, you should think of building this house for mentally handicapped children, to think of that as a kind of a debasement of what is holy, to push that, and then to push that it's heroic that he destroys a housing project, that's pretty damn radical, yeah. right? But now, that you can sell it, that it's not just some, uh, I'm some anarchist, I'm some new chain, but that actually there's a value here. And that it's a rational value. That's the even more radical thing, right? That, in fact, um, what that, yeah, so I think that's, so that you oppose like the most, uh, the, the beefiest part of the sacred cows, that's radical. But that you can stick the landing that you point out why they are so rotten, not just pointing out some of their contradictions, some of their hypocrisy, some of their nastiness, but by, by relevant to a positive image, mm-hmm. that's really radical. And that you see it in a combination of art and production, and one, and, in, and the artist and the capitalist in one. And this, that's quite radical too. 
because there have been stories about you know artistic visionaries who are unwavering and so on, but it's often against commercial values, right? Um, but that's not work, right? And it's often you know that person, but by their unswavering instinct, right? Not rational kind of calculation about what's really best for him, but he is the most thoroughly rational person, right? In the book, so that's right. I mean, the, the thinking of Rourke as a businessman is a, a not obvious point, and it's really true. So uh, I don't think Rourke even thinks of himself as a businessman exactly. And you know, there are other people like uh, who are who are seen as admirable characters who are more business-like. Um, Lansing. Yeah, Kent Lansing, who's the kind of salesman. Right. But there is a certain sense in which Rourke is a business person from the very beginning. Rourke is entrepreneurial from the very beginning. And this is what's importantly different between him or part of what's importantly different between him and Cameron. So Cameron is the artist who has these ideas, and he doesn't think much about a market or how do you make these ideas or how do you sell them to the public. It so happens that at the time when he's coming up, there's some openness to this, and so immediately he becomes a super famous architect, and, and uh, he has kind of contempt for most people's tastes. And then when the winds shift towards the revival of classicism and people aren't interested in what he's doing before. Uh, he's always been contemptuous of his customers and so forth. Now we can't find them and now he's, he's wrapped. Um, psychologically, Rourke always sees part of what he's meant, part of what his job is as how do I sell this? How do I teach the clients to know what's best? I'm trying to do something new and different that's not conventional. Therefore, people aren't going to be, you know, there's, uh, the conventional means aren't going to work for me. I'm going to have to figure out how to make a career doing this, how to find the people who want it, how to convince the people who are convincible about it. I have to give them my best and teach them to know what's best. That's part of his perspective on it from the beginning. And so part of this goes to the earlier question of why Rourke doesn't suffer in the way and isn't destroyed in the way that Cameron is. Not Cameron's not totally destroyed, but he you know, becomes an alcoholic and a, and, a, and, a, and a mass, and he's sort of redeemed by Rourke. Mm -hmm. But part of that is just is the, the order of Cameron's career went. But part of it is Rourke knows what he's signing up for. And it's not just that he thinks he's signing up for torture or arduous or whatever. What he wants to do is he wants to do this kind of building. What he thinks that he'll be happy if he's what Cameron is today it's not someone who's in Cameron's mental state, which he would never be, but someone who can look back on his career and say, I built these 10 things, I built these five things, they're really good. But what Rourke sees as a career like that is looking like is one where he takes it as part of his job to f find the people who will want it fun, to convince the people who are convincible that battle is going to require experimentation and time not working. It's, uh, one of my friends who's a businessman talks about the importance of seeing everything is in scope. This is Ray Gern, who's uh, been on a panel here before. I think this is very much part of Rourke's view. I, I want to do this kind of building. I know it's not going to be easy. I know part of the work is to figure out how to make it happen. And that means he's kind of a business like, yeah. And, and he thinks of various jobs as, as also means. So why does he take the job of John Eric Knight, where you know they'll take a little bit of his design along with mm -hmm. you know Renaissance and miscellaneous and so on? Well, he's, he's in the, just as a way of waiting, for another opportunity like the kind that got him fired from Franken and Hire, that is, someone came and they actually wanted a building like the Dana building, right? And, and that's the and, other thing, he's going to get to work on actual problems. Yeah. And, so he's going to practice the skill. He doesn't need that afterwards. Yeah. But it also, it. right, so he's yeah. going to do it, but it also says, and he's going to wait for that, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but I want to, I do want to go back to the, the, the question, which was yeah. about, so, and you've both now made a good case for just how radical it is, especially the idea of that it could be rational is radical itself. Uh, yeah. And but I, like blowing up housing projects. And project I do want to put a flag in for getting back to what is the attitude towards the disabled in this novel? Uh, and is it objectionable? Let's come back to but that. But the, the idea that you could. The rationality of it. So there's so much to say. You can give talks and lectures on the theory of rationality involved in RAND, and it's not fully elabor elaborated in the Fountainhead the way it is in later works. But just think back to Rourke's original conversation with the dean. Like, what are the reasons going on in this life? I have, let's say, 60 years to live. I'm going to spend most of the t that time doing my work. That's just how life is. I don't, I'm not, you know, moneyed and rich and people need to work and how am I, you know, this is where, this is how things are for me. I need to make money to live. I have this amount of time to do it. He comes to think that work is the meaning of life, and he gives reason for that. But 
Uh, but here I am in the world with so much time to be in the world. What am I going to make of it? How am I going to be able to uh, have that time mean something to me, to love what I'm doing with it? And the answer is, I have to love what I'm doing. And to love what I'm doing, that's going to be my work. I have to do it by standards that make sense to me, by standards that I understand, by standards that are mine, that come from my thinking, that come from my mind. And what does it look like to do that? Well, it looks like to live a life like Howard Rourke. And that's not a complete proof or argument for it, but it is more thinking than most people do about what goes into their life. And I think it's really um, deep and on the right track. And for like a more profound, spelled out, elaborated version of it, there's the objectivist ethics and Galt's speech and in Atlas Shrugged. But there's throughout you see this idea of Rourke is not this artist driven by blind passions and preferences. He's thoughtful about what makes sense why things make sense, how beauty and goodness come from a kind of rationality in the, the construction of things. And so thematically, rationality is there from the beginning as part of this Rourke-like artistic vision, and that itself is something that's unusual. If I might just add one other thing, which is that um, we have a tendency, I think, in some ways to see as less radical philosophically where the fountainhead gets because we're seeing it in the shadow of Atlas Shrugged, right? But when you get to Rourke's courtroom speech, it's openly calling for um, egotism, but, but egoism, um, that it's saying that it's through reason, which is man's only means of survival, um, that you have to think for yourself. And it puts it a little more in terms of essentially independence <laughs> than at the Shrug Will, where it, it independence is one aspect of rationality. But most of that <laughs> view about what it is to be moral um, is there and and it is you know it's defending rational egoism which is a pr incredibly rare um, position and including the idea that everything we have and everything we are yeah. comes from a single attribute the function of our reasoning mind yeah. right which it must be the same thing as the valuing thing because it's everything is one thing like, like you know, everything comes down to this and we get two different statements of what it is let me ask a follow up to what you said of Jason um, because you had you, you've done some work here to emphasize what is rational about Rourke's approach. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps another way to see that is to talk about the complementary point of what's irrational about everybody else's approach of Keating's, of Tui's. And I mean, you did bring out some of that, I think, in your talk, but maybe you could do it again, but this time with reference to the ideals that are at yeah. stake. So what um, the, the novel highlights more what is second-handed um, ra uh, in what is these irrational approaches than the irrationality as such. Usually, sometimes, particularly with respect to uh, to his coterie of artists, it plays up more of the just out-and-out -out irrationality of Lois Cook and the guy who did something with metronomes and bird cages and and so on. Um, uh, but um, but more, it's um, it's irrational in the sense that it's not using reason. It's not thinking about things. And even though um, it's not flagged in the way that it is in Atlas Shrugged as the fundamental choice to think or not think, um, acts of evasion, acts of willfully not <laughs> thinking about this or that are throughout the novel, especially with, with Keating. Um, so that aspect of rationality is there. Um, the irrationality of trying to have control or ha trying to have any kind of value through giving up your critical faculty for, f for forming and evaluating values, that's thoroughly sort of demonstrated through the novel, right? So um, you might think, right, even though it's not your passion, there's something reasonable about pursuing this career in architecture. But step by step by step in Keating's life, you see how that can't make any sense. Right? That, that can't add up into anything. And that you could try to have more prestige from more clients, but um, either it, it, you know, it doesn't work in this way, or it does work, which ultimately means it also doesn't work in what you wanted it to accomplish. Now in Atlas Shrugged, that'll be named in terms of trying to reverse cause and effect, trying to have uh, is, uh, 
trying to get estimation of others, uh, effect in order to fake having the cause, virtue, right? Having um, a be this beautiful wife, right? Uh, effect to, um, to being worth, being worthy, um, cause, right? But you do see, without naming it in those terms, um, you do, maybe a little bit in this, the courtroom speech, you do see it at play. Let me ask one more question, then we should start to take some questions from the audience. Um, and Greg, you can raise your point as one of those questions if you want at some point. But Gina specifically wanted me to ask this of you, but you can comment too. Um, because a few times in your talk, uh, you, you Tina getting back at you for asking questions from the crowd. <laughs> yeah. she, a few points in your talk, uh, you, you talked about, you were talking about Tui's motivation and about his nihilism and about his wanting to break people and even kill people. Uh, I think Rourke came up specifically. Why do you think he wants to do that? What motivates him? And, and is, it, is it only Rourke's death he wants? Is there, or there, is there no. more to it? No, that? I mean, ultimately, I think he just wants, in, in Atlas Shrug terms that are not yet, I think, available in the Fountainhead, too, he wants to die. He wants a world free of any kind of value, any kind of source of value. Um, and too, he doesn't recognize that you know, everybody was starving in the world he's talking about, right? Um, he might concede that, but it's not kind of at the forefront of what he's saying. Um, so I do think ultimately he wants that, but I, I think that, that he really craves it. It comes out in little places, right? He does have, he, Tui shows more poise, but not perfect poise, more poise than the intellectual villain, say, in Atlas Shrugged who, you know, turn shrill much more often, who show the cracks, right, show the breaks, and show thus the evasions, right, and where the reality starts to come through. But there are places where it comes through for, for Tui. So, for example, we do hear about Tui's fears. So, and we were talking about this in the car, but for, um, after, so he shows no fear when a bullet misses his head by an inch. But then afterwards he asks who shot him when he hears Stephen Mallory. Then he becomes afraid, and he can't identify the reason, but also Keating thinks that before that night of their first in-person meeting, and I think here the, the author is for once endorsing Keating's thinking, that, it part of, that both of them desperately never want to know that. And in fact, Tui even, despite, Tui asks Keating, um, after Keating, for reasons he couldn't quite tell, as he's starting to feel the kind of fear of to engulfing him, it says, you know, oh, I'm quite glad that, that maniac didn't kill you. And, and Tui, right, um, uh, says, you know, did he ever mention me? No, you know, like, uh, I've never met him. Why did he do it, right? And then Keating says, well, he's, a me he's mediocre and he hates greatness. Mm -hmm. And then it says, um, so, when, uh, so at the point of like the why, suddenly it says um, Tui becomes alert and... Uh, Comfortable, alert, and uh, like he's on his haunch, right? And then, and then when two, when Keating says that about you know mediocrity wanting to destroy the great, it says, just look, it felt to Keating like Tui was peering into his soul with a fluoroscope, right? The light thing that you use for seeing x rays, right? And drilling down, and then what, and with suddenly like intensity, and then it only kind of relents when. Till he sees the immensity of Keating's ignorance, and that puts him at ease. Uh. And I think what I understand, but I, I could be wrong, there are different ways to interpret this, is that I think for a moment, Tui is thinking, oh, does one, does Mallory know what I'm really about? Mm -hmm. And because if he does, he sees it's an existential fight, like his life or mine, and he'll kill me, and I'll die, and I'm scared, right? But with, I think for a moment he's thinking, oh, is Keating ripping? Is he putting me on? Does Keating know what I'm about? And then he goes, no, this guy gets nothing, right? It, In other it, words, it, does Keating know that I'm the one who hates great men? Correct. Mm -hmm. but, but, but the whole point of, that he's so floorscope is, is he's terrified that anyone should know, to some extent, including that himself, that that is his motive. Yeah, good. Okay, let's uh, see what people want to ask about. Yeah, Kirk? Is uh, Tui's vision of the world, the world of the anthem, or an anthem? I think so. I, when he describes um, the way that everybody is a mind looking into another mind, who mind, and all being the same, I, I think you can see the dystopia of, of that world of anthem. 
Um, and I think, I suspect Tui, you know, if you put it to him, I suspect he'd say, you know, along the lines of, I know it's turning gold to lead. Uh, yeah, I know that this world will be impoverished and will go back to the Dark Ages and so on. Um, but I think that Rand's kind of later view tends to be that, like, that's part of the thing that they hide from themselves and that they can't fully mm -hmm. get behind. Or some of them will, some, but they'll say, but that'll be a more natural and noble state, a return to our innocence, or, uh, you know, or technology is bad and all that, but, but they'll still be blanking out, like, all the human suffering and all the convenience and all that. So. Yes? I More so, there's a sort of, but let me say what positively work. So in part four, chapter one, the boy on the bicycle, and they're talking about them living in tents. It says they were sustained not by the content of work's mind, but by its method, and that's the first time you really hear about like it's its fundamental way of thinking that is the real root of that. So that's a. It doesn't fully draw it out, um, in, certainly not in like a full epistemology, but you get a sense of what facts does he, in general, what standards does he try to look for, what's he trying to achieve. Um, in terms of TUI... And, the, say, and what that method is at this point is, um, is th there is a work to thinking. There is a, a something that you're doing when you're thinking. And the alternative that's stressed is, are you doing it for yourself? Or are you not and letting others and, and expecting others to pick up the slack or writing on what they've come up with? And we're not given a lot about what the content of that method is uh, explicitly, although we are given lots of examples of it. Um, what are some of the, the examples of it? Point. You look for a central idea in things. When you're creating something, you try to create a central idea for it. When you're trying to understand something, you look for the central theme in it that's causing it. Um, he, had a, he tried to build a central idea and building. He looked for a central impulse in men. You um, try to conceptualize and name things, put them into words. It's not originally a thought named in words, but it's looking for you. You look for the principles behind things, right? So these are the things that Rourke does. He does some for himself. Um, and the alternative, the main alternative that we're, and, and then as part of that, he judges and comes up with and, and chooses things to go after for himself. So which is the valuing for yourself and thinking for yourself. And those are two parts of one process. Um, we have some sense of what the content of that process is. Uh, it's a process of integration and so forth, uh, and of looking for central themes. And then there's the idea like some people do it and some people don't. And those who don't um, are in some sense writing off of other people's doing. Yeah. They're living secondhand. If doing that is living, then to not do it, you live secondhand. So with Tui, which you, you asked about, we get some sense of, oh, so he describes some of his own methods. And we get others, you know, on display. So, for example, in trying to figure out, you know, who can, what souls are up for his grabs, right? He has certain tests that he seems to routinely do. So, for example, there's a very simple test with with Keating. You you name drop something, and then you see if he's faking it, right? Or um, or he, he even describes the. I don't think this is totally true, and this is another place where I think he's a bit deceived about his motives. But even with the um, Stoddard Temple, he says it was a trial. Um, to see if, how much he could get things to line up, right, um, and, and pull things. And I think, like, when you look at Atlas Shrugged, none of the villains has anything like that coherent of a long-term plan. Um, and they're much, and they are not driving events in a conscious way. Like, they have schemes, but the schemes are more like, oh, we'll lay out some bait, and then they'll catch John Galt, you know? Not um, even Stadler has the closest is Floyd Ferris. Ferris. Yeah, the closest is Floyd, Floyd Ferris. Floyd Ferris is the twoiest yes. one in Atlas. He's the most <laughs> scheming, and the schemes are deep. Yeah, right. They're about how do you undermine reason, and you know. Other questions. Uh, yeah. yeah. I've, I've been forgetting to repeat the questions online, so let me just do that. So expand on why you said earlier that uh, Tui was psychologically 
unrealistic right, so, in so, relation so, to so me. Rand said it was there were things about it that were psychologically unrealistic. I'm yeah. trying to make sense of that claim and figure out fully what it what it means and and in what ways is it not as it's not that he's entirely self honest. He in that confrontation with Keating, he says, oh, it's hard to destroy honesty. You're like, no, 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 you've been lying to yourself about all kinds of things, and the novel has established that, and the author knows that. Um, so is it that he just has schemes? No, no, no. Um, it's not just schemes. It's that he knows, he doesn't, be, he, he, he knows that altruism is, is, is a destructive force. He knows that it is a way of chaining people. He will call it noble, but there's a funny way in which he's both calling it noble and calling it poison. And he calls it poison, right? I don't think the intellectuals in Atlas Shrug could bring themselves to call it poison, right? There's also the extent to which he's aware of Rourke and Rourke's greatness. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not, and it's, he has taste and discernment. It's not just he can see where the flows of revenue are coming and figure out how to get or what uh, uh, people are in there. He, he's a kind of sophisticated judge of architecture, in, in fact, and then sets it in reverse. And that that's also, I think, unrealistic. Yeah, the villains in Atlas were kind of have that, but it's more of a kind of sense of smell for these things mm -hmm. than it is a very conscious understanding of what their own standards are. They can tell who the men of the mind are that they sort of have to leech off of, who, yeah, you know... In this way, the best at, in this way, the best Atlas Rock parallel is Lillian. So Lillian seeks out Reardon, she finds him, she, she's, she's insightful about how to manipulate him, right? Um, and so she's, the, in that sense, the, the one who's yeah, she 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 mimics a Dominique like yeah. image and yeah. falls for it. Tyler had his hand up before. Yeah, um, I'm curious um, about how Rand knowingly portrayed Tui portrayed Tui knowing that he was psychologically unrealistic in certain respects. How did Rand knowingly portray oh. someone she thought was psychologically so realistic? My, my How can she do that when he's the symbol of evil trying to destroy people? So I'm ask, sorry, I'm asking if she had that kind of similarity in mind. So let me draw a parallel to kind of help analyze that, right? It's Tui's the second character I know of for sure that she describes in a certain way as psychologically unrealistic by virtue of evil people couldn't be this honest or you could, and the first one is Andre in um, in Weave a Living. <laughs> that anybody who had been through the Red Army and done what he had done couldn't possibly be as idealistic or have as much of a soul left as he does, right? He would just be another, probably, killer. Um, uh, and so one question is, at the time of writing The Fountainhead, did she know that Tui was unrealistic or at least, um, you know, at least exaggerated. And the other thing is, how could she do it, right? So I tend to think she probably had some sense that he's more explicit than some of this. But again, you know, in, in art, um, as as um, Aristotle says, it is, it's better to be plausible but impossible than impossible but implausible, right? Um, and this, and it's a radical book. It's really, it's pulling the mask off of these conventional values that you always seen. And it sort of helps have this villain who can actually like lay it out. Um, this is what it's really about. And in, in some way, like so Galt is creating a new moral philosophy and he's announcing it to the world and he can lay bare what they've always been about. There's a way in which the work has to wants to understand the principle behind Vadin, and in the courtroom speech does talk about these evil motivations. There's also a way in which you can. It's a little bit of a hard sell to think of like work spending quite that much time thinking about those people at, at all. Um, maybe I'm I'm wrong about that, but um, so I think it serves the plot in the way that also Andre serves its plot. Um, it helps advance a kind of certain understanding of these ideals and where they come from. And I think 
probably she didn't have quite as fully worked out or as crisply explicit a full notion of a, of thinking and evasion and how that pervades all the way down. She knows it's dishonest, right? It's, it's dishonest all the whole time. Um, but then to further see that like it's the, the exponents of this are dishonest too, that comes later in, in her, uh, one last thing. Her original inspiration for Tui was, you know, she saw the speaker and she thought like from what he was saying, like, oh, this guy's gotta be a red. And it turned out he was, um, but nobody believed it. Um, and I think she sort of thought like, yes, and, and this is also the idea that you also see to some extent in Think Twice, that there are these people out to sort of destroy the world and they're furtive and they're spreading these ideas where the way Atlas Shrug puts it is, is like there isn't, there, there are no leaders of these movements. There are no guys behind the thing pulling the thing. There are philosophers who have had the most impact, but not in the, quite this way. So I, One thing that's worth raising here is just the question of the role of dramatic license. So Tyler, part of what he's asking is how can she do this? And I mean, whenever it's fiction, there's something that's not true to reality about it. And you get to, you get to, take dramatic license to make things more interesting and more dramatic, even if they wouldn't have, like, the same thing's happening in Atlas Shrugged, not with regard to characterization, but with regard to the strike, yeah. which she thinks could probably never happen in real life, that one guy could track down all these people and take down the whole economy because of it. Yeah. But it's a pretty interesting, like, what if he did? And what if there were someone like Tui? Yeah, so, so more important than could someone actually be as self-conscious and, um, relatively honest about what he's doing as Tui is. More, I think a more important question than that is, why would a villain like that not work and thwart the whole point of Atlas Shrugged and Atlas Shrugged? And the whole point there would be because it would, it would mess up your whole notion of the choice of thought. Right? And the theme is the, the role theme, of the mind, mind in existence. And right, so like, it doesn't make, it, it's pointing out that no, you know, the, the people who hate life hate reality, hate thinking about it, hate naming it, and their whole modus operandi is to um, turn off their eyes so that uh, what they don't see won't, in the hope that what they don't see won't be there. So we need to wrap up soon, but Greg, did you want to plant your flag question or raise your well, I mean, this isn't flag? This is the most important question, but we should say a little bit about it. Uh, and then we have about a little less than 10 minutes left. I mean, one, Jason, the way you put it earlier is how like going going for the meatiest parts of the sacred cows, and one thing that you see it's in the Fountainhead. It's also in We the Living. Um, there is a what could be interpreted as an attack on the handicapped or mentally disabled. I actually don't think that's what it is, but there's the like why is this Stoddard Home for subnormal children in there? What is the attitude taken towards the subnormal children? And it's what do people make of that? This is something that. Um, people are particularly sensitive about now and, and some of them think that it's a new sensitivity but it's not, it's been, you know uh, or at least Rand doesn't think that it is so what what is what is her point of having this what is, just to give another example one of the first things we're told about the hero of We the Living Kira Gunuva, is that her um, parents brought over a cripple for her to play with and she wouldn't play with them mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, part of the characterization of her, which might seem pretty uncomplimentary characterization here, you know, Rourke doesn't want a home for the subnormal. The author is a little bit, is she mocking the subnormal children? What's the, what, subnormal, by the way, I assume is meant to be a term that was used at the time, not, not um, offensively. But what is the, um, what is the point of all this? You know, you mentioned Think Twice. And there's a positive character in Think Twice who's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And who, you know, the emphasis is there that, you know, what, what really matters is what you do with your mind and not your body in the context of the. But that, story. what is the, yeah. It's and, and still a physical rather than mental handicap. But it's, right? I think it's a yeah. cripple, though, yeah. in the, yeah. the word yeah. used in yeah. the living, so it's a handicap. Uh, so, okay, so. And Elsmere's Chewie is, is yeah, a that's right. weak and frail child, and that's part of the whole setup. Okay. And the boys that he goes after are, you know, both described as naturally sort of strong, but also naturally bright and kind of gifted, such that it comes without effort. And for them. poor drippy months. I mean, the guy's yeah. got a post nasal <laughs> drip or whatever yeah. he's got. Like, so, you know. So I, here's how I take it, right? Um, it's not that. So the novel presents real earnest pity in the true sense as something 
ugly. And it, and real pity in the truest sense is a kind of is a painful feeling for the one who pities someone because it is sort of pronouncing a kind of hopelessness about another human being. But sometimes it, it's true, say about like Keating and something like that. Um, what I think I don't think the novel is saying um, uh, it's bad to uh, that, that people with disabilities are, are bad in some way. Right? The first book that sets whining off on his bad track is Herbert the, Spencer. Herbert Spencer. Yeah, um, it's rather it's not that um, there's something evil about the mentally handicapped. There's something evil about destroying the spiritual work of a genius to create something that, to try to elevate the, the lowest human potential. And similarly, Catherine Halsey says about Jackie's five-legged dog, which is a big achievement for Jackie, um, that see what happens when you give them artistic freedom. That's for, irony. Right. But the whole point is like, what about the artistic freedom of this gene, of these geniuses, right? Mallory and Rourke. And in that same, uh, close to that same scene, uh, where they've they've torn down Rourke's design and put up the actual subnormal children home, we're shown the 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 young kids from the, uh, the surrounding from the, neighborhood, yeah, from yeah. the slums basically, who uh, are portrayed as you know being lithe and and energetic, able and, minds, and able, but you know they they don't get to partake of yeah. this uh, of, of this the home. facilities right. at the home yeah. which which they could use and the so I think what's going on, and you see this in it's in We the Living and it's in the Fountain. There is a a thing that Rand is very much against and out to um, differentiate herself from, which is a kind of elevation of the handicap as an idol to sacrifice to, or as something that your life should be oriented around, not as. Um, it's good to solve problems and do what you can to help people and find ways to help people. And these are some people who like it's you know, whoever you can find something you can do to serve and it's a productive thing, serve in the sense of a business serving customers. That's good and the, the, here's a problem to be solved, like lots of other problems to be solved in the world. And if someone has a good way to do it, you know, more power to them coming up with a drug or a treatment or whatever the best way is to keep people comfortable. Whatever it is, it's, it, that would be a reasonable, respectable value orientation to have. But the orientation we're supposed to have towards them, I think the author thinks, is revel in their misery, ineptitude, etc. cetera, um, orient like that fact, heighten it, and so gravitate towards it. It's kind of insulting to the people with disabilities that you, you see their disability as an occasion for your virtue. Mm -hmm. That you're oriented around extolling them, oh, how nice I am to play with the people. It's not like We'll play with this kid, and they happen to have trouble walking, and that's fine, and you'll find something to do with it. But no, because they have this thing, there's something virtuous and good about you singling them out as an object to play with. And we should not figure out what's the best use. The best use, the highest thing to do, is to find the children who there's the least you could do to actually help them, and then um, lavish resources on them when you don't know what you could do for them, but it shows your virtue, your goodness, your orientation towards the suffering. It's this Mother Teresa-like, find the poorest of the poor, the most hopeless cases, don't actually do anything that will actually help them, uh, but just the, the, the concern, the gravitation towards, the, the communing with that has something noble or moral about it. And I think that's something Rand really sees as part of what's vicious and evil in the society and really wants to kind of combat. It's also what, it's also Tui's first lesson in making need a claim on values as weakness, as, as kind of replacing the strength of, you know. Um, that is, his mother loves him extra much because he's so barely alive and the bluer and more frail he was. And she thought it, it would be unfair um, to love her, her elder daughter more just because she seemed to be more worth it. Um, and and I mean, so it's really uh, but the mother. They're too the worth it. Like yeah, yeah. it's not his fault he's frail, right? No, so it's not. But it's 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 a little. But it's also not his fault. Yeah. yeah, it's but, not his sister's fault that she's healthy. Right, but but that but this is an opportunity for me to lavish more value and more attention on something because it is more needy, right, and less healthy. Um, and that I mean that's what that's the 
Chewie's first lesson in that, right? Mm -hmm. In his own case. Yes, it is. I mean, there's a place where, um, in talking about all the responses to Cortland, um, there's this uh, one woman says, you know, like she couldn't possibly imagine um, without uh, without having charities what she could do to like voice her opinions on people who didn't want to hear them um, or her friends. So yeah. Should we wrap up? Are we at time? I mean, I'd like to end with something more positive yes. than, than. Well, I have than the, yeah. something. Uh, at least somewhat positive, and that is that uh, if you're if you're watching online or if you're here live, uh, uh, I work for this outfit called the Ayn Rand Institute, and we have a uh, an online education program, and w which includes a course on Ayn Rand's philosophy through her fiction, mm -hmm. uh, where you can go into a lot greater depth on some of the things we're talking about, have been talking about the last few hours. Uh, the class starts in a few weeks. It's technically not too late to still uh, apply and, and be admitted, but oh, go to university.ainran.org if you're interested about that. Let me name something else that it's technically not too late for. So um, we're going to have a reading group uh, meeting very sporadically on Ayn Rand's first novel, We the Living, which I mentioned. Uh, it's going to meet once a month uh, over the course of the academic year, three times in the fall semester, three times in the spring. And the first meeting uh, where we're going to be discussing the first six chapters of that is uh, Tuesday evening in um, uh, in the uh, business school uh, or the other building of the business school, the GSB building. You can, uh, if you go to um, salemcenter.org slash events or just the events on the page, you'll find the information on that event. So that's another place what to go What time on into. Tuesday is that? I think it's 5.30, maybe it's 5. Uh, anyway, it's on the calendar of the, of the thing there. So if you want to delve more into Rand's fiction. But I, I just want to close on a positive point about the radicalism in, in Rourke. And we think what Rourke represents this rare vision of what it's like to be oriented around um, something you love. Mm -hmm. To be oriented around something that's important to you, that you love, that makes sense to you, a, a vision of motivation by love and of what life can be about that involve that is is rational, is passionate. I don't mean to say it's actually rational. I think it is, but the point is, it's portrayed as rational. It's portrayed as to do with valuing your mind. It's portrayed as to do with valuing your passions, your emotions, yourself as a person, your individuality. Uh, it's portrayed as taking your life seriously. And it's portrayed as great and grand. And not as great and grand because it's in service to some mawkish thing or to some kind of sacrifice. And not as great and grand because it somehow has you lord over others. And, uh, and the greatness comes from the putting down of or comparison to the lowly. It's a kind of ideal for a kind of life that one could love and be proud of and it's something to aspire to and it's something unusual and unique to aspire to how many visions can you find in the world can you find in literature of a height to aspire to that isn't just a slight that one it really is a vision of a height to aspire to and two isn't just a slight minor tweak on something you've read and seen a million times before Hardly ever in life do you encounter that. And this, is, this novel is one of the places where you do. And that's, I think, why it's been such an influence on so many people. And if I'm a, if I offer a positive thing. Um, I wanted to suggest, this is really just a, to put what you said in slightly different terms, um, to show Rourke, to show this ideal man and how he goes through the world, um, what Brian calls an ideal man, right, is to show um, also what it, uh, that idea the, of the spirit of, of youth, right? And the way she describes it is both two things. Whatever their future at the dawn of their lives, men seek a noble vision of man's nature and life's potential, right? There's this expectation that around corners there'll be things worth seeing and exciting. And also at the beginning of their lives, men are not afraid to know. They are excited about learning more and maybe don't fear th thought. 
And so the idea that you could, that you could preserve that vision of, of values into adulthood, you come to see that it's because you can, you, you can preserve um, that wanting to know into adulthood. Or if you can preserve that, you can preserve the value. I mean, just how many places in the 20th century do you see anything like that? And of those places that you see in the 20th or 21st century that are something like that, how many of them are influenced by the top net? Because there are a number of movies I can think of where you get little bits of that. And I think, without knowing that they were influenced by the top net, moreover, lots of people see them and say, oh, that's kind of like the top net, whatever. Whether or not they were, where you see this, whether it was the direct influence or not, it, it sings out to people as Fountainhead-like, both people who like and people who dislike it, right, or Ayn Rand-like, and mm -hmm. that's really striking. This is something special and unusual and, I think, important in the world. Well, with that, I think we should close up, so thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.